and uh, heat pumps uh, in Missouri Midwest definitely ties into this session and the one coming up. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I, I didn't say this in the beginning, but MEI is a Missouri-based nonprofit made up of organizations committed to um, having open dialogue, um, working to make um, increased energy um, economic development available, available here in Missouri, uh, and uh, pushing the discussion for policy changes. We hope the conferences like this and the other engagement that our board um, and committee members have, you all find beneficial and encourage you to engage. Um, with that, this upcoming session is going to look at both technologies and innovations and the programs facilitating the adoptions of heat pumps and how heat pump adoption in Missouri compares to other areas. Um, first up, uh, Ron, who's a program manager of customer technologies at Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, we'll talk and then we'll have Dan um, from the senior, he's the senior technical manager for the Center for Energy and Environment. And we will close with Catherine from um, Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, who's their market solutions and education manager. Um, thank you very much, all. Ron? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Oh my God, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> Energy efficient. Oh. Start the video again. Okay, there we go. So I am going to talk to you about heat pumps today. So I think there's a lot of interest in heat pumps. Who in the room could, uh, could feels confident that they could explain to somebody um, how a heat pump works and why it's a beneficial tool? Uh, no, that's fair. That's good enough. Okay, so I'm going to try to do that. In 15 minutes, I'm going to try to give you a thermodynamics lesson. So uh, no test, though. So two things I'd like you to take away. One is that a heat pump is not a single thing. There are many, many flavors of heat pumps and many styles of heat pumps, which I try to show in this slide, um, ranging from the very small to the very large. They all fundamentally work on the same principle, something called the vapor compression cycle. Um, and so as you, sorry, backwards. As you progress in this world of decarbonization and promote the use of heat pumps and so forth, um, you know, keep in mind that it's not one thing and that there are different devices that serve different applications, different building types, different climates, et cetera. And, um, and there are kind of several main categories. You heard a little bit of discussion about ground source heat pump this morning. There are the more common system is what's called the air source heat pump. And that just means that it derives heat from the air or derives heat from, from the earth. Um, and here I try to show that, you know, there, there's a whole range from small to large. So if you have an apartment or a hotel, you typically see the window unit or the wall mount unit, which is called a PTAC or package terminal air conditioner. Um, mine was very loud last night in the, in the, uh, the Hilton Garden Inn. Um, there's something called a mini split, which you're probably familiar with, or the new style of wall mount uh, with a out companion outdoor unit. And then there are ground source units. And there are split systems that we typically see in single family residences, sometimes in multifamily, sometimes in small office. Uh, there's a rooftop unit that's typical on office space and, um, and big box retail. And then there are larger central plant systems. So you get into chillers and centralized systems and then even larger industrial heat pumps. And they're all, again, based on the same operating principles. Um, again, going the wrong way. And so, uh, let's see, did I tell you the second thing I wanted you to take away? I forget. I told you that one, heat pumps are, are, are you know, there are many flavors of heat pumps. And two, the second thing I want you to take away is that it's, it's a new, reasonably new technology called variable capacity, which is the core of what makes the heat pump such a useful tool going forward in this pursuit of decarbonization. There's an older style that was kind of single speed and there's a newer style that is uh, variable speed and variable capacity. And capacity simply refers to the amount of useful heating or cooling that the device can do. Um, so here's a, just a simple schematic of what a standard heat pump and or air conditioner uh, is comprised of. 
And it's a, it's a thermodynamic cycle. So here's your thermodynamics lesson. There are thermodynamic processes and there are cycles. A process is burning fuel, for instance. You take fuel in one state, you combust it, it turns into a different state. So you take cold methane, you combust it, turns into a warm mixture of water and carbon dioxide. And it, and it gives off heat. And you take that heat and you use it for something. You heat your house, you fire, power a power plant, whatever. But that's the process. When you take multiple processes and you put them in a circle, you get a cycle. Well, a heat pump is a cycle. A power plant is a cycle. And when you use a cycle, you can use the processes. So you can take the heat that is, that is input to the process or input from the process and you can do work. So you can take a difference in temperatures and do work. Or alternatively, what a heat pump is, is you can input work and create a temperature difference or create heat movement. That's fundamentally what a heat pump is. So the difference between a gas furnace and a heat pump is that the gas furnace is a process and a process is limited in efficiency effectively to 100%. A cycle, which is a heat pump, is not limited by that. A cycle is limited by a more so sort of a different style of efficiency called the Carnot efficiency. And, um, and it allows you to move more heat than energy that you put into the system. And that's why we have something called the coefficient of performance. Who's heard of that term, COP, coefficient of performance? Okay, I'll get to that in a minute. So this, the, the process of a heat pump is essentially comprised of four, I'm sorry, the cycle of the heat pump is comprised of four processes, compression, evaporation, expansion, and condensation of a fluid. So there are lots of different fluids. We've heard the, th the term Freon and R22 and all these different R numbers. Those are all just fluids like water, air, et cetera. They can all kind of be used as refrigerants in one form or another. And we choose those fluids based on the temperatures that we would like to operate in. So if we know we wanna to operate to heat this space, we choose a certain refrigerant or fluid that has the right thermodynamic properties. So we wouldn't necessarily use air or we wouldn't necessarily use uh, argon, but we would use something like R134A or R410. It just has the right, has the right properties, but those are details we don't have to bury ourselves in. Um, again, going backwards. And so I mentioned these four processes that comprise the cycle and, um, and, and they, form this, they form this kind of continuous cyclic uh, operation that's a fluid flowing continuously. And that fluid goes through those four processes, compression, expand, or compression condensation, expansion, evaporation, and it just keeps going and going and going. And that's what happens here. And so the evaporation is the energy absorbed from the source. So you you're taking heat from a cold place when you do the evaporation. And then on the condensation side, you're rejecting heat into a hot place. So with an air conditioner, for instance, you are rejecting heat to the outside that's hotter than the inside. And you're removing heat from the cold inside or the cooler inside. For a heat pump in, in the winter time, it's the opposite. You are rejecting heat into the warmer inside and you are extracting heat from the colder outside. Now, the bigger those temperature differences are, the harder it is to do. And man, I'm gonna get it right by the end, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, and so what you wanna pay attention to is the relative lengths of those lines. And these lines represent uh, the amount of energy contained in, uh, in the process of evaporation or condensation or compression. So the longer the red line is, and the red line represents the heat being rejected into a space. So in a heating heat pump, red would be the good heat that you're putting into the space. The ratio of the red line to the yellow line, which is the amount of energy you're putting into the compression process, that determines how efficient this is. So keep in mind, gas furnace, you burn a unit of, of, of methane, at most you can get that much heat into the space. So at most you have 100% efficiency. With a heat pump, if the ratio of that red line to the yellow line is six, 
then for each unit of energy you're putting into the heat pump, you're getting six useful units of heat delivered to the space. And six is not out of the question. That's, this, uh, that's a very achievable number in certain applications. Um, so this is the heart of the coefficient of performance. So there's a cooling coefficient of performance, which is the blue line or the evaporation process divided by the orange line, which is the compression process. And likewise, there's a heating COP, which is the red divided by the orange. Again, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, you'd think I could figure this out. Um, okay, so these are just some illustrative examples that I mentioned something called the Carnot efficiency, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it's the efficiency of, of, of uh, how efficient a heat pump could be is determined by the absolute temperatures at which it's operating. An absolute temperature is this weird temperature scale called Rankine uh, that you might have learned in high school chemistry and long forgotten. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a temperature scale. So if you just think of the, the bigger the difference, uh, the less efficient it ultimately can be. But here, if it's a 95 degree out, a day outside and we'd like to keep our inside at 70 degrees, um, the, the maximum possible efficiency you can achieve with, a, with an air conditioner or a heat pump is 21.2, which means that if you put one unit of energy in, you should be able to move 21.2 units of, of cooling out of, you know, of heat out of your house. Okay, well, that's not realistic, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay, what if it's even closer? What if it's only 80 degrees outside? We still run our air conditioner when it's 80. Um, and you want to keep it at 70. Ideally, it could be almost 53 times. So for each unit you put in, you get 53 times as much heat movement. So tremendous potential is the idea here, that with when you burn a gas fuel, you get one unit, and at most you can get one unit of heat. When you're using a heat pump to move energy, up to 53 for certain temperatures. Okay. Reality is, is brutal though. Um, you know, so well, there are lots of inefficiencies. You know, you can't operate a heat pump exactly at 80 degrees and exactly at 70 degrees. You have to have the condenser has to be hotter than the outside air. The evaporator has to be colder than the inside air. Um, there are losses in the compression process and so forth. Okay, with all of that incorporated, still you can get to coefficients of performance in the five to six range relatively easily. So even with that, you can have very, very high efficiencies relative to burning fossil fuels. This is just my way of showing how the different cycles react to different temperatures. Um, so I, I keep mentioning that the higher the temperature difference, uh, the, the, the lower the ultimate efficiency can be. And so it's, it's relatively easy to efficiently heat and cool when the temperature difference is small. So when it's 50 degrees outside and you want to use your heat pump to heat your house up to 73, that's relatively easy, meaning you can do it with pretty high efficiency. If it's zero degrees outside and you would like to heat your hydronically heated building and provide 150 degree water flowing through the building to provide the heat, that's a very, very big temperature gradient. And that's much harder to do. And the ultimate efficiency is lower. And so the, the actual efficiency is also lower. So that's these, these subtleties um, are what's very, very important when it comes to design of systems. So you hear things like, the city of New York wants to decarbonize all their buildings by whatever, tomorrow. Um, and, um, and, and so, okay, that sounds great. But is there actually, are there actually devices that can do that? Are there devices that can handle New York City uh, when it's minus five and you, want, you have to heat a building that requires 160 degree water circulating through the building to keep it warm. That's a very difficult task from a technology standpoint. Yes, it's possible, but does the equipment exist right now to do that? Mm, kind of, not really, uh, and so forth. So uh, these are the sort of things we wrestle with at EPRI, um, you know, trying to help utilities like Con Edison and so forth uh, deal with such situations. Um, but, um, but the long and short of it is heat pumps have unbelievable potential. And I, I, 
I, I mentioned the second takeaway that I want you to have is there's something called the inverter drive or the variable capacity system that allows these heat pumps to be much, much more flexible. So a heat pump is continuously changing. It's, it's a self-equilibrating device. It's a fascinating device because it's, it's continuously self-equilibrating. And, and it's always reacting to the temperature changes around it. So when the sun comes up and the day warms up and it goes from 70 in the morning to 90 in the afternoon or in the, in the winter, it's uh, you know 10 in the morning and 30 in the afternoon, um, the system is always re-equilibrating. Well, the old style systems were just single speed. They were either on or off and you kind of got what you got out of them. And so in a residential system, you may be familiar with that these systems are often supplemented with electric resistance heat because you kind of get what you get. You design the system for air conditioning, you get what you get in heating mode, and then you just supplement with electric resistance. Well, that's a poor way to go forward for the sake of decarbonization. And in fact, it may be, it, in some cases, it's detrimental. And so what we're really looking at are these variable systems that are able to self-adjust to higher temperature gradients. And, and provide higher capacity when the capacity is needed and throttle back when it's not needed. And so all of the large systems and, and now many, many of the residential style systems are that, that variable capacity type. Um, that's the essence of what I wanted to say. Um, I think I have one other, this is kind of my, my little um, graph that I, I try to show where we stand. So the conventional heat pump is in red and its capacity tails off as the temperature gets bigger. That's kind of a, a, a downfall of heat pumps. And then there's a next generation system, which are kind of these variable capacity systems that are able to ramp up their capacity as it gets colder. And then what I term the ultimate heat pump is one that can match capacity at any condition. You know, that uh, if you're in Minnesota and you need uh, capacity at, at uh, minus 30, it can do it. That's a very, it's a more difficult uh, uh, technical challenge, but it's, it's, it's possible. Um, oops. And this is the last slide I've got. And this is just a, um, a bit of modeling that we did a couple of years ago um, in Atlanta. We just kind of made up a house in Atlanta and showed what a traditional system could do versus what a variable capacity system could do. And what you should notice is the blue shaded area. The blue shaded area is where second stage heat would be required in Atlanta in January with a traditional single speed system on the top and with a fairly ordinary variable speed system on the bottom. And those blue shaded regions effectively go away. And they, or they're very, very short uh, to the point where you could ride through them with just a very subtle temperature dip in your house, you know, probably in the middle of the night and you may not even notice it. So the point being that the variable capacity system is much better able to handle uh, the rigors of heating um, in ch sort of changing climates. That's all I've got. Uh, hope you learned a little bit, thanks. Thank you, Ron. Um, so two quick things. One, uh, we'll see if I'm any better or worse at figuring out how to drive this. Um, oh, that's a Ron benefit one. Um, so it looks like I figured out that part. The second is for those who know me already might kind of laugh a little bit because I actually have note cards and I never use note cards, but I'm literally three weeks into my new job. So most of these slides were written by someone else. And so I've had to write down some notes so I don't completely flub up what my boss hopes I'm going to say. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on who CEE is, but I would love for you to come find me and talk to me if you wanna know a little bit more. We are a nonprofit uh, headquartered in Minnesota, but we work all across the Midwest and actually are doing work in the Northeast and the Northwest as well. Um, we really thrive on being able to show things work in the field and we really thrive on partnerships. So partnerships can be with utilities, governments, other businesses, other nonprofits, associations, et cetera. So if that describes any of you in the room, we'd love to talk about what kinds of partnerships we can continue to form as we look to do more and more work across the Midwest. All right, 
Um, ele electrification or beneficial electrification has become kind of a good buzz phrase. And it's kind of the poster child for residential decarbonization. Um, it's something we hear about all the time. And it has a fairly standardized definition. The NRDC and AIA have been using this discussion on the left pretty frequently. And it's actually been now put into um, definition by law in a few places where new legislation is passed. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about the ECO Act because Catherine's gonna talk about that in a little bit. But what you see on the left is actually pulled from that legislation. So whenever you hear the word beneficial electrification in the Midwest, we're typically talking about the things on the left. Now that's great, but when I approach this, I look at this from a term I call responsible decarbonization. And that's a slightly different story, but very similar. So when we talk about responsible decarbonization, yes, beneficial electrification can play a role in this, right? So we know that that's there, but I rank the rest of it a little differently than others do. I say it has to be good for the customer. What I mean by that is not just can we get enough rebates or tax credits to bring the first cost down, but will it actually be good for the customer in terms of the comfort for them in the home? Will their operating costs actually make sense? Can it improve their indoor air quality? Those are real things that are real good benefits for the customer. If we can prove that, then folks like Pearl um, can actually help us build marketing materials. So there's value to this. Um, when I say it's good for the grid and the utility, that's similar to meaning we're not adding peak demand, but it also means it has to play well with both aging infrastructure in places and newly developing infrastructure. So whether that's microgrids or bringing on storage into our networks or going to an increased uh, place where we have a lot of things that are controlled on demand, uh, whether that's power plants or heating and cooling in our home. Good for society. Well, you could translate that to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's wonderful and lovely. But it could also mean national security, um, right? It could mean a lot of different things. It could mean improving the indoor air quality of a community because our sources of energy generation are different. And then finally, the last piece that I put in here, because we find that it's pretty critical if you want to take some of these ideas and roll them out and actually make them work. It will not work if it's not good for the supply chain, and I mean manufacturers, distributors, and installers, and for American jobs. If you cannot do those things with the type of decarbonization efforts you're doing, it simply will not get the uptake that you hope it can have. So I'm taking a slightly different approach than just what beneficial electrification brings, but the same general concept. Um, we do want to reduce our overall greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as a part of both of these strategies. So one way to think about this is how do air source heat pumps play into this? So this is a graph. Uh, we actually created a tool um, with uh, the help of a couple of institutes, um, some financing. This is just for Minnesota, um, but others are doing this around the country, state by state. And this tool allows us to change um, the rate with which we think coal-fired power plants are being taken offline on a grid and how quickly we see renewables being brought on. It's not quite nuanced enough yet to also include things like when storage is being brought on as well, but you can imagine adding that in to this. So within the state of Minnesota, where this particular emissions um, chart is given, we can look at the equipment lifetime for a purchase that you're gonna make. So we typically think of equipment lasting 15 to 20 years um, but we've all saying that we've all seen that home heating oil furnace that's like 58 years old and it's still plugging and chugging. It might belch black smoke out the side, but it's still working. Um, and there's, you know, grandpa's heat pump that is wheezing and it's really, really loud, but it kind of sort of still cools the house down. But for the most part, we want to think of this 15 to 20 year time period. If you make a choice with an air source heat pump right now, so you, it's time of replacement for a piece of equipment, you say, instead of a gas or propane furnace with an air conditioner, I'm gonna go with an air source heat pump. Over those 18 years in the state of Minnesota, um, with some pretty conservative estimates of coal power plants coming offline, renewables coming online, we can see there's a pretty strong drop in emissions over that time. Compare that to if you had purchased a gas furnace with a very base rate minimum efficiency air conditioner on the, uh, on the market, you would effectively see that line is not changing very much, right? It'll change a little bit 
um, because the air conditioners emissions will be impacted by the grid, but it's not going to have the same steep decline. And this is just from the source perspective. This doesn't even take into account um, some things that are gonna be happening in the next three or four years. Um, next year, uh, increased efficiency standards are hitting the market for heat pumps and air conditioners. Um, the year after that, um, the DOE challenge for better performing cold climate heat pumps are expected to start seeing more manufacturers delivering on maybe not quite to the you know, 21 COP heat pumps yet, but getting closer to that five and six COP heat pumps, even at cold temperatures. And then in 2025, we're gonna see a phase out of R410A and a phase in of some new uh, lower global warming potential refrigerants being used in heat pumps. So this is the source graph. You can imagine the site graph for emissions factors is also going to be continuously changing like this. So these decisions that we're getting ready to make are only gonna get to be better and better choices over the next three or four years um, as we start taking all this into account. Now, the challenge with this is this sounds great, right? Why don't we just do this everywhere? Well, you know, there are some pretty common barriers out there. Um, a lot of states, there's some pretty strong regulatory challenges with fuel switching. Even if you try and get clever and, and refer, refer to it as fuel shifting, um, it's still, you can't, uh, a lot of states will not allow you to do load building um, and there's state laws. Catherine's gonna talk a little bit about this some more and I'm gonna put a couple of resources up for you guys to track some of this on your own, but that's a real deal. And it's something we really do have to deal with. There's also different applications. We call these application types or app application specific strategies um, for adopting heat pumps. So not every scenario is the same. If I have a manufactured home or a MOB with an electric furnace and a couple window shaker air conditioners, switching that out to a more advanced variable capacity heat pump is a very different application strategy than a house that more or less does the job until the AC breaks with a central gas furnace and an air conditioner on top, right? Or that electric resistance house uh, with window shakers that where I could put in ductless heat pumps. So the application strategies really do matter and the answer is a little different for each one of them. Cost competitiveness, I, I tend to, when I talk from this perspective, not use the word cost effectiveness because that's a different set of terms we use when we talk from the utility landscape. So from this case, I'm gonna talk cost competitiveness about going all electric. Again, we're talking about first cost, the investment in putting these things in, as well as the operational costs over the time of ownership. And then this contractor and homeowner awareness or even the comfort with being able to talk about this technology and the benefits. As Ron was just talking about variable capacity or sometimes they uh, say variable speed heat pumps because homeowners, the word capacity, like what? Uh, variable speed heat pumps and variable capacity heat pumps. A lot of contractors are not comfortable explaining the benefits of this to homeowners. In fact, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the programs we work in and they're actively talking homeowners out of heat pumps still, right? This is still the, well, my uncle Jerry had a heat pump and that thing delivered 84 degree air into the house during the middle of the winter and they, nobody wants 84 degree air blowing on the bald head, right? Um, they still have, the, or, you know, sure, Dan, you say it's a 20 year life for the piece of equipment, but you're gonna to have to replace that TXV valve at least three times. You know, during there's we have stuck a lot still um, from the contractor and supply side about really being comfortable with saying no. The equipment is constantly getting better, um, and if you're buying from a, a reputable source, a good contractor who works with a good distributor and a quality manufacturer, we actually are seeing these devices that can perform at five degrees, at negative ten degrees, and produce a lot of the capacity necessary for the homes. And they do last a very long time. And they can have some uh, kick on boost temporary heat that brings the initial delivered air temperature to over 100 degrees in short bursts. It's not your father's or your uncle Jerry's heat pump anymore. But these are all common barriers we're trying to overcome. So how do we do that? Well, we believe that the necessary approach is to not just figure out one of these things, it's figuring out all three of these things. Now, some organizations like CEE were lucky enough because of those partnerships I talked about where we invest ourselves in policy, research, and programs. And because of this, we can take the learnings from each one to help influence the next. A lot of programs may not have that breadth um, and organizations to do all three. So getting the right partnerships 
So you are very aware of those who are trying to advance policy. Um, and you can learn from that and apply that to your programs. Um, and from that, you can identify where the research needs to be. I mean, this is a pretty cool cycle when you can get it to work right. And again, Catherine's gonna talk about some of the um, policy stuff. I, I did peek at her slides in advance. So I know that one or two things she didn't mention, one of them is called the um, NGIA or the National Gas um, uh, Innovation um, Program. In, in Minnesota, as a good example, actually has some mechanisms in there to allow natural gas utilities to invest in deep energy retrofits and pairing air source heat pumps with gas as backup. So there are some policy things beyond the ECO Act that are happening. And another one is called the um, Minneapolis Efficiency Technology Accelerator. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, and those types of things are making a pretty big difference. So an example of a program, um, why am I talking about the Minnesota Air Source Heat Pump Collaborative when I'm standing here in Missouri? Um, first things first, uh, this program uh, really is focused on doing technical guidance and quality inspection help for contractors, supply chain engagement, meaning we work very closely with manufacturers and distributors as well. Um, we do installer training and support. We do market data analysis and we do utility coordination. In this case, right now with five utilities, but more are coming online due to the ECO Act. Again, why am I bringing that up here? Well, due to some additional funding sources we've gotten, some of them from the national labs and some other sources, we're expanding this starting next year to create a Midwest air source heat pump collaborative. And right now we've got parts of Illinois and Wisconsin coming on board, um, but our real hope is to see Michigan and Missouri and eventually Iowa and Ohio also slowly start to come on board to a much larger program where those five or six things I identified that we're currently providing, what if we could be providing that to networks across the entire Midwest, right? A Midwest air source heat pump collaborative could be a really big deal. Um, so the Minnesota Efficiency Technology Accelerator, we no longer use the acronym, you can probably guess why. When this policy was first uh, pitched, several years ago, Facebook had not yet changed their name to Meta. Um, so this was cutely referred to as Meta. Um, we now just recall the Minnesota Efficiency Technology Accelerator or Minnesota's Market Transformation Program. If you're not really familiar with market transformation programs, they're a little different than your standard utility program. So here it's really more of a strategic process of determining in a market the things that can lead to change in market behavior that can remove or reduce barriers and it can explore opportunities um, to really create adoption across them. Um, so when we think about this, it's really fundamentally a change in the way that we invest on a utility side in how we wanna see a market change. So instead of using traditional standard market cost effectiveness to determine, can we provide an incentive for let's say a heat pump, with the market transformation program, instead, we do detailed analysis um, on, on this curve here. Ooh, um, right, we're getting in this part. So we invest heavier in the R&D and the early adopters so that much later, what our impact has been, we've transformed the market and we've seen a big change and that makes it more cost-effective later to create regular incentives. So market transformation programs are a fundamentally different way to invest in this. And in Minnesota's, which again, we would love to see this market transformation bloom across the rest of the Midwest. We've got five things we're gonna be looking at. Um, starting in 2023, we'll look at the first three and then in the next few years, we'll add on it's um, air source heat pumps, luminaire level lighting controls um, for commercial buildings, high performance windows. And then we hope in 2024 to bring on heat pump rooftop units, um, and then eventually gas fired heat pumps, which is a whole nother thing. Um, you could get your gas fired efficient equipment to get to maybe a theoretical 140% efficiency instead of 100% efficiency. So we see all of those as really good potential. Um, and it's starting in the Midwest with this. Now, Mia is also does some market transformation work. And so one of our goals is increase and enhance partnership with organizations like MIA so that market transformation can truly roll out across the Midwest. Um, I mentioned the research being a critical component. So 
Uh, we're lucky enough in Minnesota that we have these things called card grants, and that is the conservation applied research and development um, through the state of Minnesota. But we also take funding from a lot of other sources, including DOE and national labs to do a lot of research. And the big key for us is in field performance um, and then using that with market studies to create um, customer economics and rate profiles and informing utility program design. So it's field-based and it's what we do is beyond just, this is a snapshot of some of the research that we've been doing. We also look closely at others, groups like Stephen Winters and Associates, a partner of ours, Slipstream has done some great research in Michigan, um, Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and all the national labs. We take all of that research to help tell these stories. When we talk about getting over that contractor resistance to installing heat pumps, we can actually show case studies and real field-based data that this equipment can work in cold climates. Some of what we do when we have all of that, um, this is an example that we've done in Minnesota. We're also doing this now in Illinois, and we've, we're also partnering with a major manufacturer to create these cost of heat comparison charts. I can't yet say who, but um, where we can take a look at a couple different inputs, um, and we explain pretty clearly when we do this, you know, what, what went into these modeling assumptions, what our base cases, et cetera, are. But in this very first one, I'm looking at um, my utility here is Missouri River Energy Services, natural gas is the fuel type, and I'm looking at their standard, whoa, election, uh, a standard electricity rate. And when I do that, I can say if I went with a hybrid heat system, meaning a cold climate air source heat pump replace the air conditioner, and it's gonna do heating down to a certain point, what is this like for the cost of the homeowner, right? Well, in this particular case, if I went all electric, right, it's gonna cost the homeowner more now than if they just went replaced uh, basic minimum. So that may be not a very good example of being good for the customer, right? Even if we could buy down a zero cost up front. Um, with the IRA of 2022 rebates and tax credits, um, that's probably not really great. But if you look here and said, what if we kept the, the gas furnace, if we use the heat pump just down to 45 degrees and after anything below 45, the gas uh, equipment comes on, it's actually a cost benefit to the homeowner in this scenario. This is with their standard rate. But because of all that market analysis we've done, because of the policy work we've done, not just us, others, um, some of our utilities now are able to offer dual fuel rates. So instead of 12 cents KWH, if you're using um, a heat pump paired with a fuel fired piece of equipment for space heating, they will actually give you a preferred rate of something closer to seven cents of KWH, right? Um, in this scenario, Every single switchover temperature, meaning um, switching over from the heat pump, when do I switch to the gas furnace? Um, it's all a cost benefit to the homeowner for the average house. So we actually are doing this kind of work again in multiple states right now. We want to explore and find ways to do this in more states. Granted, um, with fuel switching and a lot of places not having the ability to do dual fuel rates yet, um, this isn't going to look as good in every scenario, but we'd love to be able to see states like Missouri be able to have something like this is a really good piece for a contractor to have that discussion with the homeowner about, is this a good financial decision for you? And when we train contractors, by the way, this is the number one thing they say, yeah, we love your features and benefits stuff you guys talk about, that's pretty cool. But end of the day, if I can't show a homeowner the return on investment, like Tim was talking about earlier, if I can't show them an ROI that makes sense for them, none of this is gonna make sense to me. Um, there's, and it's not just work that we do. Um, there are others. Um, anyone out there familiar with NEEP's um, Cold Climate Air Source Heat Pump uh, product list? It's basically a really nice database and specification. Um, you can actually go and look up pieces of equipment and the old way to do it, you, you had these things up top. You could pick the brand, and if you knew the model number, great. You can look at, well, do I want it to be a ducted system or a ductless system? And you can put in a couple pieces of information, like what's the heating capacity at 47 degrees and at five degrees? Um, and it would spit out a list of all the heat pumps that could deliver at that. Um, what's new, and I say this, I only bring it up because I had a little bit to do with it. If you like it, I had a lot to do with this. If you hate it, I just barely touched it. Um, 
we added some new elements now. You can actually choose your location. So the Columbia region of Missouri, um, I put in, um, I did a heat load estimate for a standard house and came up with um, my, my heat load that I need for the house and it generated uh, heating design temperature. So what this does now, instead of just giving me a list of pieces of equipment that I put on and it gives me a complicated table, um, it actually gives me a pretty sweet graph um, that really addresses whoa, something we call the Goldilocks zone, which is this gold area here. This is the maximum heating capacity of this carrier unit. This is the minimum heating capacity. It's inverter driven. It's designed to work in cold climates. So it means any anywhere in this space, this piece of equipment is always capable of adjusting itself to the outdoor temperature to make sure it's meeting the load. With something like this, you can compare different units and say, how much backup heat or supplemental heat will I actually need? Um, when will my system be in compressor cycling? Um, so you can actually compare one unit against another and actually showcase where this stuff is actually making sense. Um, so to summarize for me, we're trying really hard um, through the policy and research to define the why and the what we need to do. Then when we develop programs, we focus on the how and the when we want to do it. And then through our partnerships, we are better prepared for the who is going to do it. So again, it's the policy, research, and program triangle that's capable of making all of this work. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine, who's gonna talk about adoption rates in Missouri and the Midwest. Why am I asking Ron? <laughs> all right, let's see if I can get this. Oh, first try, we'll see if it continues. Uh, hello, my name is Catherine Eggers. I work with the uh, MIA, the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. We are a nonprofit membership based organization based in Chicago, working across the Midwest. Our definition of Midwest may be a little broader than many people's. We've got Kentucky and the Dakotas, you can see in the map there, the territory that we work in. Um, but again, we are a membership based organization. Our members include electric utilities, academic institutions, for profit companies, nonprofit companies really anyone working in our territory towards energy efficiency as a goal for energy generation, um, reduced climate emissions, job creation, all sorts of uh, good opportunities around energy efficiency. As we've talked about heat pumps today, I thought it'd be helpful to start off a little bit about looking at heat pump penetration currently in our territory. So here's some data from the 2020 Residential Energy Consumption Survey. In the Midwest, primary heating type about five and a half percent. Again, this is residential energy consumption survey data. So we're looking at residential dwellings, about five percent in the Midwest, uh, with heat pumps as their primary heating type. Missouri kind of leading the way in the traditional definition of the Midwest with about 12 percent penetration. Again, Mia's territory is a little unique, and Kentucky has about 27% penetration, so they are leading in our territory, but let's go ahead and say Missouri, Midwest, high heat pump penetration currently. Uh, I also have a map up here of the U.S. that's illustrating the percentage of homes in the state that currently have electricity as their only source of energy, so a good... Um, indication of, you know, these homes are already using electricity as their primary source of heat. So in um, the that kind of middle green that you see of Missouri and Kentucky, our homes where about 20 to 40% of homes, residential dwellings in the state have electricity as their primary heat source. The rest of the Midwest, Illinois and such are the lighter gray color, green color, about 10 to 20% of homes, again, currently with all electric home dwellings. So some Rex data that's sort of relevant to this conversation and informative there. Also a little information about a recent study published by the American Council for the Energy Efficient Economy, just released last month looking at decarbonization options for homes and apartments. And some of the high level conclusions they found was that heat pump water heaters have the lowest life cycle costs throughout the US. I think it was Dan already mentioned, or somebody today has already mentioned, you know, there's the upfront cost, there's the life cycle cost. And this is research looking across um, all of those costs. Heat pump water heaters across the US 
uh, low life cycle costs. When we're talking about heating and cooling, they found heat pump equipment to have the low life cycle costs in areas with fewer than 6,000 heating degree days. I'm not going to try and describe heating degree days up here. Sorry for those of you who don't know what it is. Let's just say Detroit, Michigan, they reference as a place that has weather of about 6,000 heating degree days. So locations, including all of Missouri, where the weather is warmer than Detroit, Michigan, heat pumps are a low cost option um, for heating and cooling costs. They did in that research, I'll mention, assume cold climate heat pumps or the hybrid systems in locations, including all of Missouri, with more than 4,000 heating degree days. So lots more in that research there, but <laughs> takeaway being Missouri and much of the Midwest um, heat pumps are or demonstrate low life cycle costs. Um, and you know, being with Nia, I have to mention that the research also highlighted the importance of energy efficiency measures being partnered with carbon or uh, decarbonization efforts to really increase and minimize the life cycle costs of the equipment. And then one more thing before I get into policy, all of that mumbo jumbo around heating degree days and climate and where heat pumps are good. Some uh, nice sort of illustration here of climate weather is getting warmer throughout our territory here. And so here's just uh, comparison maps of climate zones in the Midwest region and how they changed from 2015 to 2021. You can see the red circles there just sort of highlighting um, in the Midwest Territory, about 175 counties in just that six-year period changed to a warmer climate zone, including the Boot Heel here in Missouri, UP in uh, Michigan and whatnot, where it's getting warmer. So heat pumps are increasingly a, you know, low-cost option in more and more areas. So as I said, also want to talk a little bit about policy opportunities and challenges within the Midwest. So quick summary here of in the states of our territory, there are two states with legislation that is actively encouraging policy for decarbonization, fuel switching measures, that's Minnesota and Illinois, two states. And this um, legislation, a lot of what we're looking at here is legislation and the utility energy efficiency programs. And so two states where with commission approval, there are programs that have gone off that have electrification measures, and that's Michigan and Wisconsin. And really the bottom of my slide got chopped off here. The table did not fit well, sorry about that. But multiple states where it is prohibited by policy, Kansas, Michigan, and Missouri is in that category of, there are policies that kind of prohibit electrification measures within energy efficiency programs, and a couple of states where it's kind of not addressed or not really practiced. I'm gonna highlight a few of these states in our discussion here, we'll start with Missouri. That's where we are. As I said, you couldn't see it on the table. Sorry about that, but there it is. Pretty much, uh, pro there's prohibitions, restrictions around fuel switching programs in Missouri. Um, so, just highlighting a few of them here: MIA, the Missouri Energy Efficient Investment Act. All the definitions in that legislation are really specific around energy efficiency and demand side management of electricity, talking about reducing kilowatt hours and whatnot. As you'll see later on the slide I have about Illinois, the definitions and language is talking about reducing energy use and talking about kilobtu reduction. So that's a difference. And again, can be a challenge if you're talking about electrification and fuel switching. Um, you might not be reducing kilowatt hour usage, although you're reducing kilobtu and energy usage. Also here in Missouri, the utility promotion practice has language that's specifically stating that demand size resources should not include load building. Again, it gets to be a challenge of maybe you're increasing energy or electricity load while reducing gas load. And Another legislation called out here, not actually specific to utilities, but that there are restrictions of jurisdictions trying to adopt any sort of ordinance or resolution to discourage, uh, prohibit utility-based sources of energy, so to prohibit gas development in buildings. So let's take a switch to some of the states that are, you know, adjusting legislation and taking actions to promote electrification in the state. 
Minnesota being one, as Dan mentioned, honestly, I wish Dan was up here to talk about this slide rather than me, but here we are. There are other legislations in Minnesota, but the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act that was passed in 2021 is a law that allows and encourages public and consumer owned utilities to propose efficient fuel switching programs. And we've got here at the bottom of the slide here, kind of what these criteria or definitions around efficient fuel switching. He also referenced this uh, in his presentation, but we're talking about net reduction in source energy consumed, net reduction of greenhouse gas emissions over the lifetime. They're being cost effective and, in the, and they specify cost effective to utility participants and society and have the cost effective tests identified on how that is and it improves utility system load factor. Um, and there is some limits there in the legislation on spending on the efficient fuel shifting programs um, of the total. So other state I mentioned that has a uh, legislation that is promoting and encouraging uh, electrification is in Illinois, also a law that passed in 2021, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. But before I get to that, I'll reference back to the definition, similar as I was saying already in Missouri, there's legislation in Illinois that talks about and um, definitions around energy efficiency is talking about measures that reduce total BTUs, total energy use, not specific to electricity the way it is here in Missouri. Um, but the Climate and Equitable Job Act, again, passed in 20, 2021, similar to the ECO Act in Minnesota, which is identifying electrification measures, claiming fuel switching measures, uh, must reduce total energy consumption at the premise. So again, it's total energy consumption, that's gas and electric. The programs that they design are going to have to meet these criteria, the total energy consumption. They, it outlines a ramp up of savings within their portfolio and how that's going to expand over time. It does define that 25% of all electrification savings must come from end uses in low income housing. So that was one of the um, primary initiatives in this was looking at income eligible and promoting that and ensuring that a good percentage of the activity and programs are targeting communities, income eligible communities that uh, can benefit in that way. And uh, one of the other stipulations or criteria in the act is that the utility has to provide customers, especially the income eligible customers, with an estimate of the bill impacts of the electrification program and how that will impact them, excuse me, as individual and their utility bills. I do have a little bit here. I feel like I've been talking really fast. You know, you get to that point and you're like, wow, I'm already done. So my apologies for <laughs> breezing through this, but I do have two slides also, if I can get there. Um, just that here in Illinois, we do have some information on the utilities specifically of how they've addressed their stipulations in response. And this has stopped working. I'll try going backwards. Yeah, if you can get me, there we go. <laughs> so in ComEd, and again, just broadly, kind of three categories of each utility, how they're responding to this legislation. In ComEd's case, they have identified they'll spend a minimum of $10 million per year over the four-year period, uh, and that the majority of the funds will be spent on full electrification efforts, programs that uh, promote full electrification in a home. Across the board, the two utilities program approach is really to be coordinating with stakeholders, community-based organizations. They also identify weatherization, the energy efficiency packages that I identified in that ACEEE report as a key part of their program. It'll be electrification programs uh, along with weatherization activity. And um, again, in details about the income eligible electrification about 25% of savings claimed from electrification will come from income eligible customers. And they've identified, as has Amron, you'll see in a moment, about looking at other funding sources, including the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed earlier this year and um, pulling all that together. Amron stipulation, quite similar. They're looking at an average $2.2 million over four years. Again, their program approach is heavily involved with engaging with stakeholders. Stakeholder advisory group in Illinois and others are really involved in supporting the utilities on these program design and eventual implementation. 
And they have, uh, again, specific discussions around the income eligible electrification programs. And as I said, I went a little fast, but there you go with my slides. My contact information is up here on the website with Mia, which I'll note that I'm uh, referenced in the question period of the last thing about trainings for real estate professionals. Go to that website to find and register for some of those events. Thank you all very much. Um, there was one question online uh, while you all get yours uh, um, listed and ready to ask. Catherine, there was, they wanted to verify it. Um, the Missouri legislation, uh, the last one that you listed from 2021, simply prohibited forced um, or prohibited forced electric. It didn't stop energy efficiency. Yes, I believe that is true. I, again, I'm in a room of people in Missouri who probably are a little bit more familiar, but yeah, thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. Any questions from the floor? All right. Um, Dan, I had a question. You were talking about uh, air source heat pumps, and then a lot of your other information also included both the combination of uh, electric versus gas. Can, as an organization that does seem to want to focus on climate change, can you talk a little bit about the um, electric uh, backup heat pump? Am I making sense? Yeah. Uh, so the question, if, if you couldn't hear it as well, was, geez, it seems like if we're really focused heavily on decarbonization and you know, lower global warming potential, why are we still talking about gas-fired backup? Um, and how does that kind of differ when we, when we look at this big picture? Um, so the first component to that is, yeah, in a perfect world uh, for decarbonization, we would switch all um, operational equipment to fuel sources that were more environmentally friendly. Um, but you have to remember there are a few things involved in this. One is what makes up the electric grid where you're at. So the current mix is quite different for every state and sometimes even within the state, right? So if you're in a place that is still heavily using coal, for instance, um, to generate electricity, um, natural gas can actually be a lower carbon impact to use that. Um, so that is something to consider. Um, the second part of this really is the economics uh, for the homeowner and getting any heat pump into a home. So if we can get heat pumps into homes, even if we're just doing AC replacement for starters, and even if they are only using it, you know, when it's 50 degrees and warmer, should the rates begin to change over time, either electric rates go down, natural gas rates go up, things like time of use rates begin to apply or utilities can generate dual fuel rates. Once the heat pump is in the home, um, something like a maintenance contract that an HVAC contractor might have with a homeowner would allow them to help educate a homeowner to over time use less and less and less of that natural gas as their backup and allow that heat pump to do more and more of the work in the home. So it is admittedly kind of a bridge um, approach between now and where we eventually want to be, but it's a bridge that takes into account what we are actually having to deal with on a regular basis, right? Um, our electric grid isn't quite as clean and perfect as we want it to be in every place. And the economics are not there for operational use everywhere for all homes to be air source heat pumps. But if we can start getting at least a heat pump in every home that's switching out an air conditioner, that is a pretty huge win for us. And it sets us up for a longer term future. Uh, what I didn't talk about here, um, but others have mentioned this is the importance of pairing energy efficiency with heat pumps. I did some quick math for another client, um, just kind of napkin math. If they just did some basic weatherization measures in a home, um, we were able to show pretty regularly that you can be dropping the size of the heat pump down sometimes a full ton. So that's another, so instead of having to buy a three and a half or four ton heat pump, um, an air conditioner, you can be buying a two and a half to three ton. And that changes a lot of things, including the, the cost up front. Um, so pairing weatherization with or in, in new construction, efficient um, design with heat pumps um, makes that, that our bridge case an even better case over the long term. Sounds great. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? 
online. Um, while we wait, one question I had is, uh, this was all about air source heat pumps. Um, any comments about ground source? Availability, cost, likelihood, pie in the sky, any of those? Um, sure. So, uh, you know, ground source heat pumps are an excellent option because they work at very favorable temperatures. The earth temperature is always favorable or typically favorable compared to the, the extremes of summer and winter. And so it makes them uh, very efficient uh, and, and generally able to have higher capacity. The issue with ground source heat pumps is capital cost, typically. Um, you have to put in a ground loop. Sometimes you have one available. Um, so where uh, I would say um, sort of the, the edge of ground source heat pumps from a technology standpoint is, is looking at ways to make communities ground source, to have a district type system, um, and even then to um, look at existing district systems like in cities and try to replace coal and, and gas fired uh, heating district heating systems with ground source heat pumps that maybe derive their heat, not necessarily from a, a bored ground loop, but from a nearby water supply, maybe a river or lake, et cetera. So um, yeah, ground source is a fantastic option in terms of efficiency if you can get the cost to work. Sounds great. Anybody else want to talk about the ground source? Tim does. Tim wants to talk about ground source. Uh, under false pretenses, I was going to ask a different question. But if I need to ask ground source first, oh, okay. Um, well, we have found that the ground source with the tax benefits is pretty, pretty much of a push. <laughs> so, uh, but I was interested in what I was seeing up there with respect to the the Mia presentation, saying that the the uh, IE populations must contribute 25% of the uh, reduction in uh, electrical use. Uh, I'm wondering how is that going to be monitored and enforced and what happens when they don't get there? Because I don't see it happening at all with the communities I work with in East, in East St. Louis. Um, I don't know, Samarth, if you'll have anything to add, but generally how, you know, the monitoring will be happening and reporting out and through the Commerce Commission and penalties. I'm not so sure. Perhaps it's you can't claim the savings beyond the 25%, you know, like additional savings outside of those markets um, might be hard to claim or whatnot because you just are limited to the 25% within there. But I'll admit it's all new and a lot of this is still being worked out. Stakeholder advisory group and stuff is putting in details around it because yeah it's going to be a challenge and it's certainly something that the utilities identify too and um are at least i know we're working a bit with comed of their focusing their initial efforts of we're just looking at income eligible and that's you know like the programs that first programs that they'll be rolling out will be pretty much exclusively to the communities well Please join me in thanking a great panel on a topic that we, I think we'll be hearing a lot more about. So we are running a little long, but we still um, will be providing you with a nice uh, break, stand up, stretch your legs, um, networking opportunity. Uh, before you do that, please, uh, we do have a message from uh, one of our sponsors, Evergy. <laughs> 